Take your Bible and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, and I want us to look at verse 1 in this session. I want to begin by reading this verse. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. There was something special that was going on between Paul and the Philippians. He, he just had a special affection for them. He, he had such a love for them, and he carried them with him in his heart. He told them, I'm just always praying for you, and he was always praying for other churches as well, but this church just brought such pleasure to his heart that he has terms of endearment for them. You, you see in this passage, I mean, he calls them my beloved twice. Um, he says, you're my crown. Uh, you, you're, you're my joy. He, he affirms them as brethren. And so just even in an initial look at this verse, we see Paul's heart almost just leaping out of his chest for, for the Philippians. And it was really born out of the way this church was started. Paul came to the church at, at Philippi on his second missionary journey, and he came in and preached the gospel. You remember how the Lord opened Lydia's heart, and, and he began to preach publicly, and, and it created a riot to the point that they apprehended Paul. They drug him through the streets. They, they whipped him. They beat him. They threw him into prison. And even in prison, he's leading people to Christ, the Philippian jailer, his whole family, on and on. And there was just something about the tribulation, the trials that were associated with the birth of this church, almost like a mother giving birth to the child in which the mother almost lost her life, that this baby will always be so special to me because of what it cost me. Because of the sacrifice, is it took me to the very shadow of death to bring this baby into the world. And so it was with the church at Philippi. And, and they were just in, indelibly imprinted on the heart of the Apostle Paul. So as, as he comes to the beginning of this last chapter, he, he just can't hold it back anymore. Uh, it, it just comes gushing out of him these superlatives. So let's look at this verse. And, and I just want us to savor every part of this verse. I want you to note first the practical connection. And that's in the very first word. I'm sure you can see it in, in your Bible. Therefore. Now let's just stop right there. It's been well said whenever you see a therefore, see what it's there for. And the word therefore is always a connecting word. It's, it's a bridge from one island to another island, or one continent to another land mass. And the word therefore points back to what he has just said, really about the return of Christ and our bodies being transformed and being so heavenly minded. This word therefore brings it home to our practical daily living and shows that those who are heavenly minded will be earthly good. That, that, that's what this word therefore does. And what, what we learn here is that sound doctrine always requires a therefore. That systematic theology and biblical theology must always lead to a therefore. That all truth demands something from us. Truth is never intended to be presented to us as an end in itself. All truth is simply to be a means to a far greater end. We can never just end with doctrinal truth. As much as I love doctrinal truth, that all doctrine requires a response from us. Truth is never intended to be merely interesting. It's never intended to be merely intellectually stimulating. All doctrinal truth has a therefore attached to the end, and it is to lead us into the will of 
God for our lives. When I was in seminary, I, I studied under R.C. Sproul, and I remember the class immediately before my first class with, with Dr. Sproul. I had a professor, the class was Christian Worldview, and I remember in the course of that lecture, and it was a week-long class, that he said sometime during that week, he said this, it's just stuck in my mind. Men, I'm going to come hear you preach one time, and I'm going to sit right there in the middle of the front pew, and I'm going to hold up a sign in the middle of the sermon. And it's just going to have two words on it. So what? Question mark. So what? So what the virgin birth? So what the sinless life? So what the sin bearing death? So what the bodily resurrection? So what for your life? All of those doctrinal truths I just stated are yea and amen in the Lord. They are true, but they are bridges to lead us someplace, to lead us to faith in Christ, to, to lead us out of the world, to, to lead us to live in a distinctly different way. And so the word therefore at the beginning of chapter four is actually a critically important word. All great preaching must have a therefore. All great Christian writing must have a therefore. It brings things down to a bottom line conclusion. So therefore, what are you going to do about it? So that's the practical connection that we see right there in the word therefore. It's one of the most important words in the Bible. Second, the pastoral affection. Please note this tender, loving way that that, that Paul addresses them, and there are five things to draw to your attention uh, about this. Uh, he says, therefore, my, my beloved. The word beloved goes beyond just saying, you're someone I love, that there's an intensity about beloved. Um, it is a, a deep-seated affection that Paul has for them, uh, deeper than just that they are loved, that they, they are the beloved, deeply and dearly loved by Paul. And he also refers to them as brethren. You're my brother. You're my sister. In a sense, we've shared life together. We're in the same family. We have the same father. We, we have the same Savior, your brethren. There's something, there's a loyalty, and there's an allegiance within a family, or it ought to exist within a family, and it does in the family of God. And then he adds, if that's not enough, he says, whom I long to see. This is almost getting a little mushy. <laughs> whom I long to see. I mean, it expresses a deep desire to, to, to be with them. And, and Paul is such a manly man, and he, he is such a mission-oriented man. He's such a project-oriented man. And yet, at the same time, we, we, we see his heart just bleeding for people and to be with them. I long to, to see you. And then he adds, my joy. <laughs> they bring so much joy to his heart as he reflects upon them. It's been 10 years. He just can't get them out of his heart. He can't get them out of his mind. Um, that his heart just overflows with gladness as, as he thinks about them. They are a means that God is using to bring great pleasure to his heart. And then fifth, and this is almost over the top. He calls them his crown. Um, it's the word Stephanos that refers to the, 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 the victor's laurel that was placed on the head of the athlete at the end of the game. The, the crown on a king was a diadem. This is not a diadem. 
Paul does not see himself or see them as a kingly crown. He, he, he sees them really as the spoils of victory. He, he sees them as trophies of grace. He, he, he sees them as the crown upon his, upon his ministry. And he's just been talking about the second coming at the end of the previous chapter in verses 20 and, and 21. And while he's still thinking about the return of the Lord and his citizenship is in heaven and his body will be transformed, he then thinks about the crown that will be bestowed when he is in the presence of the Lord. And he says to the Philippians, you are the only crown I desire. You are my reward. Um, seeing you receive a crown in heaven is the only crown I desire. What a, what a, what a selfless, loving way that he refers to the, to the Philippians. I mean, he had led many of them to, to faith in Christ. Um, he had helped plant this church. He had served them faithfully. He had sacrificed for them. He had suffered persecution on their behalf, and their hearts were just welded together. He was so proud of them. He was so grateful for how God's grace was so at work in them. You know, it's been well said that a marriage can be either a little bit of heaven or a little bit of hell and not much in between. And I've been in different churches and it can be a little bit of heaven or a little bit of hell and not much in between. Um, this church was a breath of heaven for Paul. And even while he is sitting in prison in Rome, they are a source of immeasurable joy to his heart. I, I trust that God lets you be in a church like the church at Philippi, that your brothers and sisters in that church are such a source of encouragement and source of gladness and, and joy that you long to be in church, not because you have to, but because you want to, that, that your heart is welded to other believers and you're just drawn on the Lord's day to gather with this worshiping body. That's really how God intended us to live our Christian lives, with, with this kind of affection for a local church. And this is the way that Paul feels for them. I want you to note third, the personal exhortation. Paul now begins to express to them what is required of them. And he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm. Stand firm. It's an imperative command. This isn't an option. I, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ, nail your feet to the floor. Nail your your, your convictions to the wall. Nail the mast to the, to the ship and stand firm. It's in the present tense. Be always standing firm. It's in the active voice. Take action to stand firm. It's in second person plural. Each and every one of you in the church, stand firm. And this implies that there are forces trying to move them around. Now, this clearly implies that there is the force of the Judaizers that would move them away from purity of doctrine in the gospel, that there are worldly forces that would try to seduce them into godless lifestyles, that there would be pressures for them to, 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 to be more inclusive of the other religions there in Philippi. No, Paul uh, commands them and says, you must not yield to the pressure. Uh, you must not collapse under any persecution. You must not sound retreat. 
You, you must stand firm in the midst of the paganism of this culture and the domination of Caesar and the corruptions of the world and the lies of these false teachers and their twisting of the truth and the attacks of the devil and the, the jealousies of, of, of other, other believers. You've got to stand firm. Be the church. To stand firm means to dig in your heels, to anchor your soul, to deepen your convictions, to galvanize your faith, to solidify your beliefs, to cement your commitment. To stand firm means that you say with the early church, church father Athanasius, contramundum against the world, that I'm willing to stand against the entire world if need be, to stand firm. We know those words of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. I can do no other. Here I stand. God help me. That's what it is to, to stand. It's what Nicholas Ridley, it's what Hugh Latimer said to Nicholas Ridley as they were strapped to the very same stake in, at Oxford as they were being burned for their faith. Be of good comfort, Hugh Latimer said. Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley. Play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out, close quote. And I tell you to this day, it has never been put out because they stood firm. And even Thomas Cranmer, when he recanted his confession of, of, of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone, in order to avoid that stake, he eventually recanted his recanting. And when they brought him to the stake, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but when they brought him to the stake, he put his right hand into the fire first that the fire would burn off his right hand that had signed the original recanting. No, he was standing firm for the truth. Jonathan Edwards, in one of his 70 resolutions, said, always think of the death of the martyrs. Why? Because it inspires us to stand firm in the truth. To stand firm means to hold your ground, to hold fast to sound doctrine, to hold fast to the truth of the Word of God as you stand upon the Word of God, as you stand by the grace of God. No, we must not let up, back up, or give up until we're taken up. There's something else that I want you to note in this verse, and that's the powerful union. Notice the next three words after stand firm. In the Lord. You can't stand firm just in yourself. You can't stand firm just because you want to stand firm. You need supernatural grace to stand firm. You need, if need be, dying grace. You, you need the power of the Holy Spirit to enable you to stand firm. Everything that we do for the Lord to stand firm for Him can only be done because of our vital union with him. We are to stand firm in the strength that he provides, and he gives a greater grace. He will say later in this chapter, in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I, I, I had that verse calligraphied and mounted over my bed in college such that every day when I would come home from football practice and go into my room 
and to see that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That whatever the challenge, whatever the temptation, whatever the resistance, whatever the lures, whatever the pressures that would be going on around me, that I can stand firm by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That this is the grace that we all need. In Ephesians 6, in verse 10, Paul writes, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In Colossians 1.11, he says, We are strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. We can only stand firm in the Lord, meaning by his grace. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy and says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 3, verse 16 says, We must be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. The Holy Spirit dwells and lives within our innermost being. And that is where we need the power deep down within us, not in a superficial way, just laying on the exterior of our life, but down at the very center of our soul. And that is where he releases his power and his grace from the inside out. It is deep and it is real. So we must stand firm in the Lord. And then at the end of this verse, a fifth thing I want you to see is the passionate reaffirmation. As Paul circles back around after his strong exhortation to them and calls them my beloved. He's, he's already called them the beloved. And he reinforces this now a second time, calling them yet again my beloved. They're not just merely brothers and sisters. They're really more like a spouse. They're, they're, they're much more, this is much more tender and intimate. You're not just my brother. You're, you're my beloved. And this takes this to a whole new level. And so, as we wrap this up for verse 1, I, I think we see the kind of heart that we need to have for our church, the kind of heart we should have for brothers and sisters that we worship with, the kind of heart we should have for our pastor and pastors and other leaders, elders, deacons, teachers, that we should have our hearts welded to them and have much affection for them. But more than that, in these declining days, the gathering storm that is going on around us in the culture, we need to stand firm and hold our ground and hold our convictions. And the only way that we can do that is in the Lord and in the grace that he supplies. May God open the windows of heaven and pour out the fullness of his grace upon each and every one of you, that you would know what it is to be welded to his word with deep allegiance and loyalty, as we would be easily moved were it not for the grace of God. May the Lord give this to us.